Susan D. Anderson is a history curator and program manager at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, a member of the editorial board of California History Journal, and a member of the Council of Friends of the Bancroft Library, UC Berkeley. She previously worked as a curator and director at the California Historical Society in San Francisco, the African American Museum and Library in, at Oakland, UCLA Library Special Collections, and USC Libraries. She has organized numerous exhibitions, appeared in media interviews, acted as advisor on public humanities projects, and published and lectured widely with an emphasis on California's hidden African American past. Susan's book, Nostalgia for a Trumpet, Poems of Memory and History, was published by Northwestern University Press. She is completing volume one of African Americans and the California Dream for Heyday Books. Please give a warm virtual welcome for our moderator this evening, Susan D. Anderson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dev, and thanks, Sue. Um, I'm really happy to be joined by our distinguished panelists. They're going to be sharing their insights and their experiences uh, to illuminate this wonderful new book, Comrade Sisters, Women of the Black Panther Party. And just to remind you, yes, after we hear from our panelists, we will be opening up to your questions. Our panelists are Gail Asali Dixon, an artist, an ordained minister and a former member of the Black Panther Party from 1970 to 1976. She worked on the Black Panther Party newspaper from 1972 to 74, and we'll be discussing and showing some of her art, which is in the book. Gail is active as an artist today, and her work includes interpretations of Bible stories, spiritual musings, and lessons from the environment. Her art is for healing, self-awareness, memory, and understanding. Erica Huggins is an educator, Black Panther Party member, former pol political prisoner, human rights advocate, and poet. For 50 years, she's used her life experiences in service to community. From 1973 to 1981, she was director of the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. From 1990 to 2004, she managed HIV AIDS volunteer and education programs and supported innovative mindfulness programs for women and youth in schools, jails, and prisons. Erica has been a professor at Bay Area colleges and universities and an educator in racial equity and self care in sustaining social change. Stephen Shames uses photography to raise awareness of social issues with a particular focus on child poverty and race. His photographs are in the permanent collections of 40 major museums. And just a few of them that have his work in, are uh, MoMA in New York, the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. He photographed the Black Panther Party for six years between 1967 and 1973. So welcome to you all. Um, we showed earlier just a handful of images from the new book, Comrade Sisters, Women of the Black Panther Party. And mm -hmm. when anyone who leaks through the pages of this book is going to be struck by the extraordinary collection of sumptuous black and white images, the photographs, they're more than documents, they're, they have an eloquence, they tell stories, along with the art that is included. Uh, the book also contains powerful remembrances by women about their days in the Black Panther Party. And for our viewers, I just want to take one moment and mention that the Black Panther Party was founded in Oakland, California in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. And Erica wrote in her introduction to the book that the young founders were torn by their vision of freedom 
and the reality of the routine deaths of men and women due to limited health care, inadequate housing, food insecurity, police abuse, and incarceration. They formed an organization to defend and redefine their community. The party uh, grew to become a national and international organization dedicated to people's liberation. Stephen and Erica and Gail, how did this project come about? Erica, do you want to, or do you want me to? Well, uh, the, the, the Panthers at one of their reunions decided, um, I think it was the 55th reunion at any rate, uh, decided to honor the women. And that gave me the idea to, to, to do a book. And I, I had known Erica, you know, for many years. And so I asked her if she would like to collaborate with, with me on the book. And that's really how it, it came about. I mean, the, the idea was that women were 60 to 66% of the Panthers and were really vital to starting all the programs. Yet most people, because of the media and the government um, ideas of you know what they tried to say about the Panthers, kind of ignored the women. So we felt that it was really important to tell the not to it, you know it's not against the men. The, the Panther Party was both men and women, but unfortunately. That's just the way in our society, which is uh, somewhat patriarchal. Um, women's stories are often not heard. And women, as we know, have been active in every movement, you know, from the beginning of time, the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement, and especially the Black Panther Party. So we wanted to tell that story just to fill out the history and really to give the due to the wonderful women. I mean, when I started the book, it just blew me away. You know, I knew a lot of the women, but when I actually started looking through the pictures and then reading the interviews that that um, Erica and, and Angela LeBlanc um, had, had helped compile, um, you know, I was surprised. It just blew me away how incredible these women um, were and, and still are. So I hope that comes through to people when they pick up the book. Well, first of all, Susan, I, I want to just thank everybody for being here. I think I know some of the people who have popped up in the chat. So welcome, everyone, and um, thank you for being here. And thank you, Steve, for setting the tone for um, part of the history of the, the how and why of this book. And I wanted to say that for 30 years, before Steve called me to ask me to collaborate, I had this dream of saying the names, not not a, it was a waking dream. It stayed with me all of the time of saying the names of all of the hundreds of women in the Black Panther Party, who some of whom gave their lives, um, uh, who whose names are never sung, whose lives are not known, and you know we have an idea. Probably most people can think of five women of the Black Panther Party, if that. And that wasn't how the party came together. A call was made to draw people all over the country and then later the world to serve the people, body and soul. That was our motto, one of our mottos, because we knew that there was great power in people and specifically young people. We were median age 19 when most of us came to the party, like, like um, Asali and I and many of the other women who whose stories are in this book. It is magnificent. And Steve said it, it blew his mind. However, it also um, 
did the same thing for me. Every single story was, I want to, I don't want to say unedited, but it was not edited to be some <clears throat> proper kind of voice. It, these are the women's voices in these stories. These are, why did I join the Black Panther Party? Why did I stay in the Black Panther Party? Why did I feed the babies? Why did I take the seniors to the doctor and the grocery store? What made me want to do this? And so we're always in a situation of um, pretty dire circumstances, but there is something every single human being can do. And we thought that this book was one way of uplifting people because there are no war stories in it. It's just the love that pours out of the women's hearts and Stephen's photographs and Asali's art for what we were really doing, contrary to what the United States government was saying about us. And Asali, your story is in the book, not just your art, but your story was in the book. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Thank you, everybody. I, I just wanted to actually just piggyback off of what you said. Because um, as I read through the um, the stories, I read the book, you know, through the book and listened to the stories. Some of the, the stories are the heart of the party. You know, you can, you can, if you had any doubts, any questions, if you had any concerns, no matter what, when you read those stories, you get the heart of what the Black Panther Party was about. And, and um, it's not just the women, the heart, but the heart of the whole party, that's all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, it was about, we were there to serve, whether, well, that's enough, but we were there to serve. Well, the, you know? te the testimony, we served from our, we served the, from our the testimony, that is the textual part of the book is very powerful. And for those of you who are gonna get the book, when you, for, when you open it inside the cover, the first thing you will see is the list of names of those women who are included in the book. So from the beginning, you're immersed, you're immersed in that. And you all have brought up this word and certainly when you read the book and look at the images, um, one of the words that comes up over and over and over again is service. And people talk about serving the people and women in this book talk about their devotion to living a life of service. Um, in fact, there's one Ethel Ethel uh, Paris, she was in the Philadelphia chapter and the Oakland chapter, and yeah. she said, I enjoyed serving people, and I loved the people I served. So could you talk more about this, this ethos, this, <laughs> this love that expressed itself in service? That I think a lot of people, when they think of the Black Panther Party, that isn't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. And that's exactly why we had to tell our own stories. It's been said by many people over time, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will. And somebody else was telling our stories. And so this book is like, as one woman said to me, she said, this book is a gift to my family, but it's also a book um, that will live on its legacy. So it, it was a way of making history, correcting history in our, on our own, in our own way, in our own terms, in our own voices. And the reason why there is misunderstanding is that the, the United States considered us the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. Well, that was because, A, we loved people and we created programs that 
were not in existence then between 1966 and 19, let's say 81. The party ended in 1982. Um, and so their, their, the governmental systems set out to, the quote is, neutralize us, which a fifth grader told me one time, that's an ugly word, Miss Erica. That means they wanted to get rid of you, wipe you off the earth. And, and I said, yeah, that was the intent. However, that isn't what happened. We, as Asali said, we just kept serving. Because when, when the senior said, feed the babies, how are we gonna say no? No, we don't know how to do it. Let's have a meeting about a meeting about doing it. No, we just said, okay, somebody has to have some food and we'll just get up at four o'clock in the morning and cook it in church basements and so on. This is while we were being surveilled and stalked by government systems. This wasn't, you know, this wasn't easy at all, but we had love in our hearts. We didn't want people to suffer who lived in conditions of poverty. And let me also say that the Black Panther Party just didn't just serve people in the Black community. We were nicknamed the vanguard of the liberation movements because of our community survival programs. And so organizations all over the world pattern themselves after us in a way that what we call now as we call it mutual aid now, but we were creating programs that didn't cost people any money, like the busing to prisons program. Our prisons are not visible to us. They are two to three hours away. How do you, if you don't have a car or the money to travel to see your beloveds, how do you visit? Who's in those prisons and why? So it was our way of looking at it, analyzing it, and then coming up with a simple way in community to serve people. It's kind of amazing to look back at it. I actually don't know how we did it, but we did. Yeah. Well, I think that the book, one of the things it accomplishes is that it, re, it, it is a reframing of the public understanding of who and what the Black Panther Party was. And it's really a revelation to, to read it and to kind of immerse yourself in the images. It, it's it restoring the centrality of women to the party. But also by doing that, you just become aware if you weren't before, of the programs, um, the Black Panther Party was was operating programs in the community, and I want to talk a little bit more. We'll talk a little bit more about those programs in a minute. There's um, in the text, it says that the the women who were in the party and who are treated in the book. Um, it says these women, comrades, sisters, were mothers, sisters, aunties, cooks, house cleaners, churchgoers, middle and high school students, college students, teachers, artists, factory workers, retail workers, poets, dancers, writers, and musicians. Um, but one thing that really does come across is how young you were. And I, what I think is interesting is, like you said, our youth, and we said, we put together programs that are models today. That's right. You know, like the Oakland Community School, there's a school in East Oakland, I just went to a graduation, it's called a Decolonizer School, and they put out Decolonizer News, they have a studio, they have a science lab. And um, there's a, a school in Sacramento that's patterned young people, young people 
pattern and pattern pattern earning you know what i'm trying to say their pet the open community school is the pattern for them to uh uh organize their school around the same thing and they give away food once a month you know and and we were what 19 18 14 and some uh, some oldsters in their 20s and <laughs> maybe getting, getting close to 30 you know but um these were these are because it's talking about what erica was saying it's talking about changing the system from one that doesn't care to one that cares and it's showing that this is possible and stepping in and and, and filling the gaps that i mean yeah. the programs i think that we could do a whole show a whole discussion on how influential the programs that were innovated by the Black Panther Party were, um, whether it was the ambulance, the free ambulance program that was set up in North Carolina before we had widespread EMTs in the United States. That's right. Or the free breakfast program that was national that shamed the US government into providing free breakfast in public schools, mm -hmm. or the sickle cell anemia testing that was contributed greatly to the community clinic movement. And, you know, and, and one of the things the book is demonstrating to people is, a, is about this work, that's what the work was, and that it was largely women who were running these, who were creating these programs and running these programs. I mean, is that a that's that's a correct observation? That, that is a, that's an accurate observation. As Asali said, not instead of the men, but so many women were drawn drawn to the Black Panther Party, and and stayed and sustained these programs. We had 64 different community survival programs and we intended them to be replicable, to be repeated as Asali was pointing out about Oakland Community School. We, we didn't want any, any fame or glory and we certainly didn't get any money for what we were doing. We just did it because it needed to be done and when I was teaching, I met a young man who lived with sickle cell disease. And one day he was really quiet young man in the classroom. It was about the community survival programs of the Black Panther Party. It was taught at Merritt College in Oakland. And um, he raised his hand, which I never asked anybody to do. People could just speak, but he wanted me to, to see him. And he said that because his parents, before he was, long before he was born, um, one had the sickle cell disease and the other one had the trait, both parents. He said it was the, the, the community, the People's Free Health Clinic in Berkeley that taught his parents how to talk to doctors about sickle cell because they didn't know they were calling it pernicious anemia. It's a totally different thing. Mm. Cause of that, when he was born with the disease, especially in childhood, is a very painful disease. Um, they were able to advocate for him. And he said, so I thank you and all of the people you know who are still alive for making a way for me. It was so touching. The whole class fell silent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why I say legacy, something that lives on for decade after decade after decade. Um, so, and Stephen's pictures are such great Document. proof of, of life, you know, like, we can say all we want about what we did, but there the pictures are. And certainly the stories are from women who shared them with us in 2022 before the book came out. 
Stephen's photographs are from that time that Asali right. was talking about. And, and it's just it's just an amazing combination for the senses and for, as you said, to educate us or to highlight what we were really doing. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your questions. I want to ask Stephen a little bit about what it was like to spend that very concentrated period of years photographing uh, the party. When something was, if there was an event, a funeral, a rally, did people, were you, did somebody call you or were you, as they say these days, were you embedded <laughs> in the party? Um, I think I was embedded. Um, what 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 happened is is really I I was a student at at Berkeley University of California, at Berkeley, and people may know that at that time Berkeley was kind of the center of the left revolutionary movement in the United States of opposition to the war in Vietnam. And, and, and also Berkeley was a, was a place where people were really questioning, um, you know, America's kind of racial, what, whatever you want to call it, you know, the segregation was kind of over, but the civil rights movement was on and Berkeley was a, you know, that was the place where the free speech movement was, and the students were really wanting to make a a a, a better life. I mean, it's really interesting. I'll I'll answer your question in a second, but I just wanted to say something about that because Berkeley and San Francisco State were the two first universities where the students went on strike to create a black studies departments and black studies courses. And Berkeley, there, there weren't that many black students at Berkeley at the time. But so really what it was the white students, mostly, you know, most of the students were white and they all, you know, most of them went on strike. And that was, again, you know, to a large extent, you know, it was because of the free speech movement and those leaders, but also because of the Panthers. The Panthers were always on the campus. And I remember when Eldridge Cleaver came to, to speak, the, the Sproul Hall Plaza, it was like totally full and people were on the roof of, 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 the, of the student union and the buildings. I mean, the Panthers were heroes to us. You know, our students, we, we came out of the 19... 50s. I, you know, I did a book with Bobby Seal before this book. And one of the things I talked about is I grew up in the 50s, as as Erica did and and Bobby and Huey did. And basically, we we grew up in a segregate, you know, our childhoods were segregated. I mean, officially segregated. Now there's still segregation in, in terms of, uh, but not legally. You know, so that's number one. So one of the things that happened was I went on the first peace march in 1967 in San Francisco, and I went with my dad, who was a kind of Stevenson, Edley Stevenson liberal, you know, and he was against the war. Um, and we marched. And as I'm marching along, I saw these two very charismatic black men selling red books, Mao's little red book. And it was Huey and Bobby. And I took one picture and went back to, you know, the, the, the campus later. And I, none of us can remember how it happened, but somehow I, I, I was working at the Berkeley Barb, which was the underground newspaper and also working for the New York Times and Newsweek and the AP and, you know, trying to make some, some money from them as I was a student. But anyway, um, I went by the Panther office and talked to Bobby and showed him some pictures and he liked the pictures and kind of invited me. He became my mentor. And that is really how I got involved in the party was really through Bobby Seal. And he introduced me to everybody. And what was unique about 
to me, which I didn't think about it at the time, you know, when you're young, I, I was 20. So I was again, you know, just one year older than the median, the median age. I was 20 when I started in 1967 photographing the Panthers. But what was unique about it is that the Panthers invited me in. And so what's unique about my set of pictures is, you know, everyone has pictures of the rallies. You can go to the AP, the New York Times, the LA Times, everyone was at the rallies, but not everyone was at the houses. Not everyone was at the schools. Not everyone was at the breakfast program when they were cooking and not everyone could go, you know, into the office. So they, they trusted me. And that's, it's really amazing. People don't realize you know, the government tried to portray the Panthers as a bunch of black nationalist racists. Well, Nixon administration, that's where the, all the racists were. The Panthers welcomed anybody who wanted to make society better. They made alliances with the young patriots and in, and Erica can talk about this more, but the young patriots in Chicago, and I photographed the young patriots and they had the you know, the Confederate flag on the back of their, their, their jacket. And they, they made alliances. They made the first rainbow coalition. So the, the Panthers were really just an inspiration to, uh, to all of us. And so, you know, I didn't, I was just starting out. I didn't know what I was doing. I I had no training as a photographer. I just picked up a camera and just the same as the the Panthers who who didn't know how to run a breakfast program, but they did it. You know, we just we did it. You know, I didn't take a course in the photography. I just picked up the camera and started shooting pictures, and it, that's how it happened. Well, we have greater abilities than we often imagine, and I think that that's one of the lessons that we can learn from the Black Panther Party when we see these, you know, these uh, hopeful young people full of dreams who are just, you know, creating these programs and getting this work done. And the book focuses on women. So we're focusing on women. And one thing I did want to mention is that um, a lot in in addition to talking about service and serving the people and serving community one of the comments that gets made in many different fashions in the book from the women is that they they mention that they they inherited they that they have a heritage of service and quite a few of them will mention their mothers or there is um uh, one woman norma Armor Mtume, who uh, said her father told her when she was in the Black Panther Party that she reminded him of his mother, who lived in the in the deep in the country in the South. And when her neighbors went hungry, she would load up her mule with with food and vegetables and feed them. And he said that his daughter reminded him of that. And he said, "I guess it's in the blood." And in, in their family, it may have been in the blood, but it's also in the culture. And I just wanted you to all to make some observations about that heritage. Well, uh, that you know, you're, you're a historian. I mean, who kept the black community together during slavery and during segregation? You know, I mean, with all the things that people were suffering, the, the, the Black community could have just died out, but it didn't. Why? Because some of the men, but the women. And that's where that service comes from. It it's goes back, you know, 400 years. The women were keeping the culture together. And I think that's another revelation about this book is that it is showing people who pick up the book can see that cultural heritage being expressed in the Black Panther Party um, when, it, when they may not have thought of the party that way uh, before. One other thing I want to mention is 
there is one woman in the book who is actually talking about her mother, um, her late mother, uh, who was Janet uh, Cyril, and yes. her da her daughter uh, Malkia, Malkia, mm -hmm. and um, her mother ran the breakfast was from Brooklyn, ran the breakfast program in New York, mm -hmm. and Malkia said her mother felt that the Black Panther Party was one of the most explicitly feminist Black organizations. It's the reason why my mother, she said, could openly support me as a queer person. The party was the only Black organization in the country at that time that had a commitment to working with queer people. A whole hugely significant aspect of party culture and politics that I think that we should talk about. And uh, before we move on, we're gonna look at some slides, but maybe um, you could talk more, a little bit more about this. Stephen already mentioned how the, the Black Panther Party worked with everybody who was interested in liberation. And this was an aspect of that. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to comment on something that you said a little earlier in terms of influence, um, um, not being conscious at the, at the time I'm growing up in North Oakland of the uh, laws that, that had us segregated in the housing. But, but, you know, it's interesting to think that influenced me that eventually I wind up in the party and the things that stuck in my head that I remember now from back then and what I remember is that we couldn't go over in the yard. We, if our balls went over, I lived in a lived in a com, an apartment complex, and the kids in the apartment complex, if the ball went over in the other yard, we couldn't go over there and ask to get the ball because they didn't allow us over there. But we, if the ball went in this lady's yard, we can go and knock on her door and ask to get the ball, and. Another another memory that stayed with me, and I know it influenced me being in the party, is my mother uh, saying that she was going to vote. Now, why is this sticking in my head? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm what seven, eight years old. You know, why is this in my head and it stays in my head? But she's going to vote for Eisenhower because he signed the Civil Rights Bill. So politics is. Uh, um, pretty strong in my family. We, uh, uh, me and some friends and family, we'd go to my mother's house and listen to uh, the album, record album of Malcolm X's speeches, you know. And then uh, in the late 60s, there's this cultural revolution that takes place that affirms all of this and exposes us to uh, these speeches and these uh, uh, I, these these thinkers mm -hmm. and these people have been, who have been crying genocide for since since the beginning, you know. So a lot for me was the politics yeah. that drove me in that direction as part of that cultural heritage that that are, is passed down among black women yeah. that people don't know very much about because when people talk about women in the United States they're not usually talking about black women that's right or think that we even have thoughts like that you know that we we think like that that, that we're that's part of our thinking too you know yeah What's that famous saying? Um, all of the people are men. Um, the, 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 the people are men, the women are white, but some of us are brave. Yes, I remember that quote. I don't know who said it. So did you want us to talk? I, would I, I don't mean to interrupt, but what I'd like to do is start looking at these images that we have lined up from the book. Okay. Um, and I know Dev is back there. 
like the Wizard of Oz. She's she's, <laughs> she's operating the machinery. And what we want to do here is have you all please speak up and share. Because um, one of the things about these images is that they're going to help our audience understand some of the programs that we're talking about. Um, well, this, this one, what's, what's interesting to me about this image, and this was the Panthers approach, you know, government programs, you have to fill out forms, you have to go to them. The Panthers went out in the street and did sickle cell testing. They didn't require the people to come out. They didn't make the, they didn't ask this woman, what's your income before we test you for free? Do you, are you rich? Are you poor? How much money do you have? Come by our office nine to five. No, the Panthers went right out in the street. And that to me was the approach and what was different about them and the government programs and, and so many nonprofit programs, you know, that are in poor, poor, poor communities. The idea of, of the Panthers was from the bottom up. They, the, what, what is it that the people wanted? Not that some scholar or, or person was thinking, oh, this is the program we ought to make for the people and we'll, push it down on them. So that's what I see in this in, in this picture, that they're out on a street corner and they're just going to the people. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to say, because my memory, I, I, nobody ever, nobody even really heard about sickle cell until the Panthers started talking about it. That's another aspect of legacy and the work that the, the Panthers were aware of this as a, as a, you know, a disease that targeted our people and um, developed a response to it. And, and the consciousness about it in the medical community is because of the work that the Panthers were doing in programs around the country. Um, we, I would, if we could move on to the next slide, we're gonna look at another, maybe we could, you could share with us some of the history of what we're seeing here in these images from the breakfast, a breakfast program. Well, um, one of the things to know about the breakfast programs is that they started in Oakland in a church called St. Augustine's, which is mentioned here, but then spread across the country. And there were many breakfast programs, like for instance, in Chicago, they, they were all over the city of Chicago, in New York, the same way, in San Francisco and in Oakland, the same way. I mean, I could tell you about every state, but we don't have the time for that. <laughs> the reason why is that when people are forced to live in conditions of poverty, food insecurity is high on the list. And we knew because we were black women and men, and not only that, the party um, had women and men who were white, the party had Latinx people, indigenous people, Asian American people in its ranks. So we knew what it was like to, for a mother to not eat dinner because all she had was enough food for her children or to send the children to school hungry and, and let them know there would be lunch there for them. What we wanted is for every child, and we couldn't do this for every single child, but we, we we developed a pattern, like Asali said, where if the children went to, before the children went to school, we would wake up really early in the morning and be in some school or church basement or some community center area and cook food, nutritious food, and serve it to them. See the smile on that little girl's face? That's that's the result of service. It isn't just that she's eating. 
what she likes to eat, perhaps. She's cared for. She feels loved. And the little boy who is with the woman in the kitchen there who um, is giving him something to take with him, we're talking about be making it so that children go to school capable of retaining that which they are learning. This is something that people who do not live in poverty don't ever have to consider. I think that uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, the, I think the breakfast program was probably the most widespread program. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, one of the reasons I put that picture in is because the Panthers also fed a number of white children. Mm -hmm. Again, contradicting, you know, the government, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? The government calling them a bunch of black nationalists and racists and you know criminals and 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 but there it is that anybody who is hungry came in the panthers didn't ask the child are you hungry if they were there they got fed mm -hmm. okay next slide thank you and now we're going to talk about schools well, well i'd like to say and asali you could follow up if you'd like i'd like to say pretty quickly that as we see yvonne here yvonne was an instructor um she also was widowed early in her life like i was um and so she is teaching, but do you see the closeness of the children? She's like an auntie to them or a big sister. So they trusted that she wasn't going to shame or blame them if they didn't know something. She wasn't going to ignore a little girl who raised her hand or a little boy who had a question because he didn't understand. Um, this particular school, the Intercommunal Youth Institute was for, as it says here, the children of the the sons and daughters of the Black Panther Party. And when that school was open, um, parents from the neighborhood, it was because, pardon me, I forgot to say this, because schools were treating the sons and daughters of the Black Panther Party in a in a negative way, sometimes teachers were told untruths. And so they, it wasn't good. So we we created this school so that we could teach them ourselves, a little bit like the predecessor to homeschooling. Mm -hmm. and then the neighborhood families would say, well, I want, you're really teaching those children and you love them. I want my baby to be in that school. <laughs> Why can't we have a school like that? <laughs> and so within, this was like 1972, in the school year of 1973-74, um, we got a dedicated building because that's what one of the grandparents came to Huey to say, we need a dedicated school site, big enough for all the children in the community. Of course, that was impossible, but we did open a school in 1973-74 school year called the Oakland Community School, simple name, because who could figure out what intercommunal meant? And um, the it was tuition-free, community-based, child-centered. We served three meals a day, and we had the best staff. Asali was one of them. She was an art teacher and more um, that I have ever had the great privilege of working with. And people, people, we had a, a, a waiting list of unborn children. Mm -hmm. People came from all over the world to see this school. And it was, uh, it was given a, a particular kind of approval from the State Department of Education for California. When the assistant superintendent came to visit, he left in tears, wishing that the state of California could do this. Well, it can. It, it just can. <laughs> it wasn't 
it wasn't um, difficult to do. It was hard work, but the willingness, right, as open as it was necessary to be in community and serve the community as it is, rather than trying to make the children different. Mm -hmm. we, we we love them as as they as they came to us. Gail, could you talk about um, what it was like to be an art teacher well, in the school? I, I, was both, I was both an art teacher and a preschool teacher. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, um, the I'll give you an example of a preschool teacher. Well, there's two, two examples, but I'll give you one. Oh, a comment, people used to, we used to sit around, when I taught the kids, when I talked to ch taught the children, and we would sit around like one table, one long table that curved like an S, when we would eat our snacks and stuff, and people would comment, come in and comment, this, you guys are like a family. I'm like, yeah, these are all my kids, you know? And um, we treated each other uh, like family. Um, um, one child had a, I guess she had a nervous disorder and she would eat her food almost whole and it would come back up. And so we talked about it, these are preschoolers, and we talked about it and the objective was to get her to eat slowly. And cause she would throw up at the lunch table in the lunch room and so when we go to lunch the kids they didn't ostracize her they didn't humiliate her you know they helped me help her remember to eat slowly mm -hmm. and enjoy the food and let it go down and she didn't throw up at, at, at the table you know so Again, it goes back to caring, you know. And um, we, I used art in the preschool to teach the kids about um, their cognitive skills and things. And that was just, that was what I was gifted with. So that's what I used. And I was encouraged to do that. And as a um, art teacher for the school it's one um one 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 experience that stays with me because i just love the way this child i was teaching them about geometric figures and geometry uh, like a precursor to geometry and I was teaching them about geometric figures. And I and this is the old school, old building, old doors, old locks with the, the skeleton key lock. And the skeleton keyhole looks like a little circle with the triangle sitting on top of the triangle. And I asked the kids to find those shapes, that combination shape. And all the kids were look, were wandering around the classroom looking for that shape. And this one kid, money B. And he sat there and he looked and studied and studied. And he said, I think I found the shape. And he had, he found the keyhole. He saw it in the keyhole. So we just did innovative little things to, to uh, help get over the ideas and the lessons. And in terms of the preschool classroom, we worked with each other, we, we saw each other. We, we were, they weren't objects, they were people, they were human beings, and we worked with human beings. Let's uh, move to the next slide. Thank you so much. And it's, in, it's interesting how vivid your memories are of that classroom. Um, and I think we've got a couple of people we may recognize here. <laughs> that Stephen recorded way back in 1972. What is it like, Stephen, to have known them for so long, to have observed them 
as a photographer uh, side by side while they were working and and you know it's endured the relationships have endured so so for such a while well it's it's inspiring uh, i'm I, I don't know what happened to asali's hair though <laughs> <laughs> You cut it short, Stephen, like yours. Didn't you use <laughs> I know. Mine was big, too, back then. <laughs> all, all of us. No, I mean, I was a photographer, but also, you know, part of the family. You know, it wasn't like, like uh, you know, I was over here and they were over there. I mean, everyone who became, was with the 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 panthers if if they were helping out in whatever way because you know the paper used a lot they used to Sally's pictures in the newspaper but they also were publishing my photographs in the newspaper so mm -hmm. you know so, so we, were, we were just friends and family together that's mm -hmm. really what it was like mm -hmm. you know? let's let's move to the next slide and we have a chance to there there's artwork the book has many types of media and and modalities it's very textured there's text there's photographs but there's also artwork and i gail what is it about this this was this was in the paper Yeah, you produced this while you were working on the paper. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what the work means. Well, working on the paper, that was almost a 24-7 job uh, 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 endeavor. And um, we worked closely with the editorial staff, in which Erica was an editor at one point. And uh, we worked on, I, I, I'm going to tell you though, we, we had one of the earliest computers. And it was as tall as I was, almost. And um, you had to use a lot of code. So I learned um, a skill that helped me later on. But um, we, we uh, typed the story on uh, film, and then we uh, put wax on the back of it, and then we laid it out on this grid. And before we laid out the article, we would sit down as a cadre, and we would talk about the articles that we were going, to, where they were going to be placed, and what size headlines, and what titles to put with them, and and uh, how to place the headlines, and how to place the pictures. And, and then uh, after we talk about basically the subject of what we were dealing with. Now, when I came in to start working on the newspaper, 72 to 74, this is during the time of Bobby Seale running for um, mayor and Elaine Brown running for city council. So we have uh, Oakland as the base of operation. This is the, this is the campaign. Mm -hmm. and so all the... Uh, the um, the drawings are centered around exposing the contradiction in uh, uh, in in the society and uh, encouraging people that you have the power you have the power to make this change and so we would um, talk about the uh, what we were doing with the newspaper and then if it was my turn. I'd go in there and I'd start working on uh, images to uh, get the point across. And uh, I did several, I did a, I was very realistic in my style, but I would take on, we all did this, kind of intermixed, intermingled our styles, you know, and uh, influenced each other, you know, but uh, uh, did a lot of collages. And to get the idea across, change you can make the change. Mm. The vote. Let's move to the next slide, please. And this, this was 
Mm -hmm. No, go ahead, please. Image for me, I like it because it uh, situates a time in history. It freezes the time in history. And not only is it Bobby Seale running for mayor and Elaine Brown for city council, but around the newspaper is Shirley Chisholm for president. And inside the role of the newspaper is Ron Dellums, re-elect him, uh, congressman, first congressman to be elected uh, African-American to Congress. And so um, Shirley Chisholm, I've, I've had this image up at, at exhibits and I've asked students that have come in, their teachers that brought them in and I was like, does anybody know who Shirley Chisholm is? And I hear crickets, I don't hear anything. And then I asked the teacher, I said, do you know who Shirley Chisholm is? And I've had a couple of teachers say no. So of course I give them their homework assignment, right? But the thing is that this Shirley Chisholm, I mean, we're talking now about a woman running for president. That's 1974, 72. She's running for president. And not only is she a woman, but she's an African-American woman. That should be something that everybody, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I think everybody should have this on their historical list. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I like this. Mm -hmm. But you notice she's more realistic with shading and stuff than the other one. The other one was more block print mm -hmm. or shading uh, in it. And we mm -hmm. use the color, we, we only had like, it was black and white, but we had one color and we would choose a different color every week. And we'd overlay the image and then we would trace around the image with what we call ruby list. And then everything that was cut out, everything that wasn't cut out, I mean, everything that was cut out would get the color. Mm -hmm. So, and then we'd go, you know. In, in the, the printing, yeah. In the print. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we and move to- just so folks can know, the stuff that's in her bag is the original clip art. I just like to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move to our last slide. And I wanna just mention that after this, we're gonna open uh, to questions. And I thought it, it makes a lot of sense. We just saw two of, um, of, of Asali's uh, illustrations for the paper that had to do with politics and political campaigns. Um, and the uh, voter registration that the Black Panther Party did transformed Oakland. Um, and it led to Oakland having its first African-American mayor when Lionel Wilson was, was elected. Lionel Wilson would have never, he was, a, he was a great guy in a lot of ways and had deep roots in the community, but um, he never would have been elected without that um, neighborhood-based organizing and voter registration that the, that the party did at this time. Any comments on the, the women that we're seeing? I yeah. love the gloves on, that Cheryl Curtis is wearing in this picture. Yeah. Well, we were not, we were respectful of our communities. Um, we didn't just go to the neighborhood community centers, we also went to church on Sundays to talk to people about registering to vote. We were in the streets, we were in the schools, we were everywhere. And I want to point out that next to Cheryl is Arlene Clark, who worked in so many different, she served in so many different community survival programs. There she is registering people to vote. Her heart was so generous and so sweet. And um, and she also informed us of how we could improve the SAFE program that operated out of Oakland and the idea for it spread across the country. 
the SAFE program, that's an acronym for Seniors Against a Fearful Environment, because the elders came to us and they said, can, can you children take us to the supermarket and the doctor and the bank? We can't do it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we had a van, the SAFE van, and Arlene rode in it and took many people. There were many people who worked on it, but I will never forget that Arlene came, called me one day and she said, I took Miss Johnson to the grocery store and I got her home and was about to say goodbye, helped her in with her groceries. And she said, no, sugar, come on in and get something to eat. And I knew I was supposed to be back at the office to go to my next thing in community, but I sat with Miss Johnson. And Erica, I want to let you know that our elders are often living alone. They don't have a lot of money and they need companionship. Can we not just drop them off? Can we visit with them? And so we improved the program in that way. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl was just a, a very, very kind and, um, and quiet person, I want to say, both of them. But to see them together here is really beautiful. We, we didn't believe in necessarily the two-party system, but we knew when we were wanting to make a change in government that registering people to vote would make a difference. That is how Lionel Wilson became mayor. And um, that is Bobby and Elaine ran for office to let people show know about that particular power of the people. Exactly. We well, I'd love to, I, I wanna say thank you. Um, and what I would love to do now is to open up our discussion okay. um, to members of the audience. So we've got, um, I, I believe Dev is going to, yeah, um, so thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. Um, as Susan said, we're opening up the floor for questions. So I'm going to read off questions we received from the audience in the middle of the discussion and then continue to type questions into the chat and we will ask them as we go. Our first question from the audience is, were there multiple divisions and missions of the Black Panther Party? Maybe we could get the full screen of our panelists. Oh, well, thank you. I, I, Devora, I'm not clear on that question, but I'll try to answer it. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if the person asking, and I wish I could talk to them, but the, if you're asking about did we all do the same thing or did we do different things? Um, we all did a lot of different things. Um, and I'm, I'm, that sounds overly simplistic, but when I was talking about Arlene, I think she had four different programs she was in and sometimes took care of the party office in Oakland. Um, um, some of us did speaking. Asali was on the newspaper with her art before she came to Oakland Community School. I'm not sure if I'm answering this question. I do want to say, though, that we saw our community survival programs as a way of providing self defense for community. The original name of the Black Panther Party was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And that was what frightened the US government and allowed them to create a narrative about who we were and who we weren't. But of course, we, we did different things. We wanted to make sure that our communities were safe and protected. But one of, the, one of those ways was to patrol the police. That was the first program, if you if you will, of the Black Panther Party. And also we recognize that if people aren't eating, don't have jobs, don't have housing, don't have shoes, coats, whatever is needed to live 
to have the basic um, needs met of our lives, then we would give it if the government wasn't. So I hope I answered that question as and unless looking at the chat, I think you did. Yeah. Yes. Um response. Yeah. Just to piggyback off of that, when I worked on the newspaper, after we finished working on the newspaper, I'd go out and sell the newspaper and collect for sickle cell anemia and come back and pack up bags for groceries for the to give away. Uh, when we have an event for the, to uh, you know rally people to to vote for Bobby C. and Elaine Brown, mm -hmm. so, I remember um, speaking. By the way, to the point about um, Malkia's statement about uh, the party being both feminist and supportive of queer people, we didn't have the letters now LGBTQIA plus that it was just gay liberation um, at that time. And there was a gay liberation front and we that was part of our coalition. But what I just remembered is that when um, Bobby and Elaine were running for mayor, I went to the Gay Democratic Club to represent the Black Panther Party in Oakland, um, Gay Democratic Club in Oakland. We wanted a new world not just a few changes over here or there. We didn't want anyone to face an ism. And many of us were born in one body with all those different things to battle. So we were very ahead of our, our time. I have another question here. What inspired you to write the book now in this moment? Because that was then, and this is now. If, if you've seen the book, um, and some have and some haven't, the foreword is written by Angela Davis, because she was there then, and a member of the Black Panther Party for a year. And then the afterward is written by Alicia Garza. Doesn't that bring us to the current and the circumstances still exist. That's not the fault of the Black Panther Party. Structural systems change when structures change. So um, it, it was time, I think, not only time to, as Stephen first said, to talk about honor and um, show the women's impact, but also in the, in this century we're in, in the 21st century, women are finally being listened to. And that's important. And it's also important for girls and young women, especially young activists today, to understand the importance of love as we serve and of tapping into the joy that's always in us, regardless of the challenges. And and part part of the reason the book's coming out now is sometimes it it takes a long time. I mean, in 1970, Huey wanted to do a Panther book and asked me to co-author it with him. And we did the book, and I traveled across the country and photographed in all these places and we got to New York and the publisher refused to do it. And it turned out that Spiro Agnew, remember Spiro Agnew was vice president under Nixon. Um, basically Nixon decided he didn't want the book to come out. And they, at that time, were using the Internal Revenue Service and other government Think people were scared of Nixon. And if a publisher would have published the book, the government would have gone after them. And so it took 40 years for the first Black Panther photo book to come out. And that first book, which was um, done in 2006, hardly got reviewed. The New York Times didn't review it. In 2016, on the 50th anniversary, I did a book with Bobby Seale. And at that time, the New York Times gave us the front page of the art section. 
almost the, the whole page. And this last book finally made it to the book review. They finally dealt with it actually as, as a book. So part of the reason sometimes things don't come out is because, you know, to get a book published, you have to find a book publisher. It has to be, you know, everything's political. And so part of the reason it took, took this long is also this is because of the woman's as Erica said, because of the women's movement that's been very active nowadays um, in the past couple of years, and women have raised their voices. And so now, you know, let's face it, most of the editors on at, at book publishers and, and magazines, a lot of the top editors are men, they're not women. And so it took a while for things to kind of for them to be brought along. I mean, that's the whole political process. And that's what the Panthers understood, you know, always understood very well. The Panthers were always very, very, very um, practical about what they were, what they were trying to do. They didn't, it, you know, going back, I, I remember this, you know, I was at Berkeley and there were so many of these groups and they would have meetings about you know, what is the tractor factory going to be like after the revolution and the workers are going to own this and that. And they would talk and talk and talk and talk and not do, you know, just talk. But the Panthers actually did stuff. They actually came up with 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 a program and, and their their community programs not only were to make a political point and shame the government, if, if this country is the richest country in the world, why are there children who are going to bed hungry? But it wasn't just about that, it was also to do it. I mean, if someone had given the Panthers $10 billion, they would have fed everyone in the country. Yes. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. You know. We have another question here, if you're game. It should be a softball for you. <laughs> um, so many tellings of the Black Panther movement have been aired, presented, and written. If I had to watch or read one particular account of the Black Panther Party, which would you recommend? Which one in particular should be avoided? <laughs> well, you should read our book. The one <laughs> about, obviously. <laughs> I think I actually, Steve, I agree with you. I think that this book is a good beginning. Yeah. Because it gives a truthful context. And there is another book um, called Black Against Empire, which tells uh, a pretty true and accurate history of the Black Panther Party. It started out as a book that would be just interviews with party members and the authors, Joshua Bloom and Waldo Martin um, spent years interviewing party members and it dawned on them that they could be doing that for the rest of their lives. And they put this wonderful book together. It is really wonderful. You get to see the changing ideology of the party over time, the community survival programs, all kinds of things. The context for which a Black Panther Party would even occur. We didn't drop out of the sky. Um, so um, Black Against Empire and now um, Waldo's daughter um, did a, a version of that book called Freedom um, for young people, for high school people and young adults. So, I mean, there are so many books I would suggest that if you don't believe that um, the our FBI, this is our country, um, had as its mission to kill members of the Black Panther Party, then see Judas and the Black Messiah. And the word Messiah has its roots in what J. Edgar Hoover wanted to do to prevent the communities from loving us in the way that they were. So um, there are all kinds of books. And um, there's also a bunch of interviews. I'll, I'll pitch the book I did with Bobby, Power to the People, 
also interviewed a number of, of Panther women and men. So right. that, that book is, is not just about the women, but it also has a history of, of the party and, and a lot of other pictures and some of Emery Douglas's artwork. And so um, that's also, uh, you know, a starter book, you know, that if, for people who wanna know about the party. There, there, there are at least 40 books written about the Black Panther Party. I think if you go online, you can find many of them. And, and some of them are written by women. Uh, they are autobiographical. So but I think there is no um, lack of information if you want to be educated about it and its relationship to other movements. Um, by the way, there is a book called um, Want to Start a Re Revolution? Radical Women in the Black Freedom Struggle. And Angela LeBlanc Ernest, who wrote the study guide for this book that is available um, you know, in the chat, how to buy, how to get the book, how to get posters, how to get the study guide. Um, early on, I think in 2010, Angela and I wrote a chapter in that book on the Oakland Community School. And also in that book are stories of other women we would not know about from the 1920s until the book was published in 2010. It is a beautiful book and, um, and one that you wanna keep in your library. So that would be helpful also because we're in proper context. You know, we're, we're not, we're not, the book doesn't um, um, deny the importance of Black communists, of the Black Panther Party, and the entire freedom struggle. So. Okay, we have lots more questions here. We're actually not going to get through them all. So um, I think it's time to, we're going to conclude our program. Yeah. And um, I want to actually uh, relay the words of one of the women in the book we've been discussing as a, to help us close out, Veronica Ronnie Hagopian. Yes. There is just she, who, of the National Committee to Combat Fascism who said, look beyond the obvious and question, question, question. Don't be afraid to argue. Arguments can result in new awareness and self-growth. And with that, I want to say thank you to our panelists, Gail Asali Dixon, Stephen Shames, Erica Huggins. Thank you to our wonderful audience. And thank you to the California State Library, especially the History Center that put this program on. And with that. And thank you, Susan. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. And with that, we're going to say goodbye. <laughs>